So, uh, uh, beforehand, I I want to thank you for bearing with my English pronunciation and <laughs> mistakes. <laughs> um, but I, I want to. I had the intention of having a translator, but I was persuaded to speak in, in Spanish. And I mean in English. And um, and I'm grateful for this pulpit also because it's very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Very comfortable. <laughs> okay, so um, my uh, my topic this morning has a very charming title: "Walk in the Garden with Adam and Eve." And um, as I was uh, preparing for preparing the material for for the topic, I thought of my walk with my wife Rachel. We have been married for. 31 years, and uh, she left her career in chemistry and pharmacy to um, be a helper fit for, fit for, my, for me and my min, in my ministry and in all the ori- other areas of my life <clears throat> uh, for the glory of God, because she loves the gospel and she loves God uh, and she was willing to come with me and to spend her, spend the, her life in the ministry. <clears throat> and um, indeed, we have enjoyed um, walking in the garden of God's blessings for many years. <clears throat> so it has never been perfect. And it has never been has never been easy, and we have gone also through um, through the valley of the shadow of death uh, sometimes in our lives. <clears throat> but thankfully, we have we have also known the grace of God, the grace of restoration that sustained us. And I'm sure that all, uh, all, all of you who, who are married here uh, can relate to this. You can relate to the, to the delight and the intimacy of marriage. But you can relate also to the struggles of marriage, to the difficulties of marriage. Um, and that's because we are humans. We are human beings, and uh, we are descendants of Adam and Eve. So, um, studying about Adam and Eve is going to be very useful for us this morning. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to uh, pray with me, please. We're going to pray. We're going to ask God's blessing. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity and for the blessing of this morning and this fellowship. For everyone here in this place, we ask that you speak to our hearts, to our consciences, that you um, transformed us with your word and that you uh, let us have a clear mind and a pure heart uh, as we listen to your word. Help me, please. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As I, as I said, um, the topic of my, of my, I mean, my topic this morning uh, has this charming title, A Walking in the Park with Adam and Eve. And I want to focus uh, particularly on the delight and intimacy of Adam and Eve in the, in the park, in the garden. <clears throat> 
When we, when we say a walk in the park, we can easily think of, of relaxation, romanticism, delight, intimacy. And when we think of Adam and Eve in the park, it's easy to think that way. And it's right to think that way because, because uh, Adam and Eve at that time in chapter two of Genesis were perfect in every sense of the word. There was no sin in them. And also the, the garden the garden, was, the garden of Eden was set for delight and for intimacy. Everything was perfect. In, in fact, the name of the garden, Eden, is a, tra- is a transliteration of, the Hebrew, of, of a Hebrew word that means uh, delight. Eden means delight and lo- or, or luxury. So we have Adam and, Adam and Eve here walking in the garden in delight, in luxury, in relaxation, in love, in intimacy, which is amazing, right? It's, it's sweet to walk like that, something that we wish we had in our marriages. It was absolutely amazing to walk in this garden, Adam and Eve walking in delight, in perfect delight, in perfect intimacy. <clears throat> and uh, the, the life of delight and the intimacy of Adam and Eve wasn't uh, um, limited to to their relationship. They, they, they in fact had um, intimacy and delight in everything around them, with everything, everything around them. Beginning with God, they were intimate with God. God was their creator. And they have perfect fellowship with God. It was amazing. And uh, with nature too. They have, they have perfect uh, delight and intimacy with nature. They were made of the dust of the earth, of the ground. And they, had, uh, they have uh, dominion of, uh, over the, the creation. And you know that Adam gave names to the animals. And I'm, I don't know, but, but I, my, my sanctified guess is that they had a good relationship with the animals and some kind of communication with the animals. You think of it uh, when, when the serpent talked to, to Eve, she didn't she didn't get scared. It seems like it was natural for her to, to speak with the animals, right? So this, 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 uh, this, is, this tells us that there was intimacy in every respect with God, with the creation, and of course, between them. Adam and Eve were very intimate. And they are here, walking in the garden, walking in the park. They really were able to leave out the question of number, uh, the question number one of the shorter catechism. What what does the shorter catechism say? That the end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. If there was a time that someone lived and experienced in, in every respect this reality, it was this time. It was Adam and Eve enjoying God 
and uh, glorifying him forever. So this gives us a glimpse of, of what our goals should be in marriage. Because obviously it was God's design for them to walk in delight and intimacy. However, in order for us to profit from what the scripture teaches us about marriage, we must focus not only uh, in the ideal state before the fall, but we must also consider what happened after the fall. Because after the fall, something really awful, something really terrible happened in the life of Adam and Eve. If we compare chapter two and chapter three of Genesis, chapter two speaks of delight, fellowship, and chapter three speaks of pain, uh, of struggle, misery. It, it, is a, it is an awful uh, difference. So here we have them walking in the light and then in chapter three they're walking in misery. And, and this is helpful, my brothers and sisters, because uh, it helps us to, to um, to set our minds in the reality that that's the way marriage is. It explains why sometimes our marriages are so sweet and there are some seasons of, of our marriages where, which are kind of bitter, right? Maybe not here, but some other places <laughs> with some other people. <laughs> That's experience. I think we can all say that. And, and, and seeing chapter two and chapter three explain that. But God is good. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of mercy. And there is hope. So please um, uh, come with me and we're gonna um, we're gonna focus on, on these on three lessons from, from chapter one, two, two and three um, of the book of Genesis um, related to the experience of Adam and Eve. First, Let's consider Adam and Eve in the garden. Chapter one and chapter two tell us about Adam and Eve in the garden. They were created for delight and intimacy. That was God's plan. As I told you, as I told you before, they enjoyed this with God, with creation, between them, everything was perfect. God created them that way. <clears throat> they were, they were um, created to be partners and to have um, to, to subdue and have dominion over, over creation. They together, not only Adam, but Adam and Eve. Chapter one of Genesis, verse 26 says, Let's add, uh, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion 
of the fish of the sea, etc. And verse 27 says, God, so God created man in his, own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He created man. He created man. <clears throat> he created man. Male and female. Man. Male and female. So they were partners to subdue creation. And that was perfect. They could do that without bickering, without problems, without, you know. They, they, they were, it was perfect. Oh, um, it was perfect. They had this vision, this, this commission to go and take control of everything. And they have the resources, they have ability, because God created them with the ability to do that. <clears throat> but also God, um, God created them to be friends and companions. To be friends and companions. Good friends, as it should be in our marriages. Our best friends should be our our wives. My, 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 that's that's the way I try to live. I I I try to I try to um, to be my wife's best friend. I'm not very successful always, but I try. Even when I do my best, I sometimes I fail. But that's, that's my goal, because it's what God wants from, from us, from the woman too, in regard to the husband. Friends and companions. Chapter 2, read with me, chapter 2, verse 20. says that out of the ground... The Lord formed um, the beast and, um, and then the man called every living creature. They gave them their name. And then in tw verse 20, verse 20 uh, says that the man gave names to all the animals. But there was no helper fit for him. <coughs> among the animals. So the Lord <clears throat> um, took a rib from the flesh of Adam and the rib uh, was made into a woman. He brought the woman to the man. In, cha in, in chapter uh, 2, verse 23, we have the very first Song love in the Bible. Chapter, uh, chapter 2 and verse 23 is a song love. You know, that's when, when someone is in love, they, he likes to sing. And, uh, you know, and, and one of the most effective ways to, to gain the heart of a woman is to sing to her, uh, and to make poems. You know? That's what Adam did he, he he made a song in a poem chapter uh, uh, verse 23 is that it's, it's, it's a song in a poem it's, so the bible teaches us how to you know gain the heart of a woman what 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 did the man said this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she but she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. It's a beautiful song, right? <laughs> beautiful, very romantic, very nice. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that he, in Hebrew, is, it sounds better. <laughs> I, I, my guess is that they spoke Hebrew. Hebrew I don't know. 
What was the language of, of Edom? <laughs> but whatever it was, it, it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, and, and she fell in love, believe me. And he, he, he saw that woman and said, whoa, <laughs> what's that? I've never seen something like that. And, and, and here that's a woman, and she became her, his friend, um, her friend and, and, and companion. And she was perfect. So help her. Adam and Eve in the garden. But also, God created them to be one flesh in sex. One flesh in sex. So they were created to be, to, to be partners in subduing creation, to be friends and companions, and to be one flesh in sex, which is wonderful too. That's, uh, you know, that's the essence of marriage, sex. It's not the only thing, but it's absolutely important, sexual life. Verse 24 says in chapter 2, Therefore a man shall, shall leave his father, father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And, chapter, and verse 25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So they have a perfect, beautiful, intense, amazing sex life, sexual life. <clears throat> As it should be in our marriages, right? That's the way it should be. And that's that the way it was with them. So let's pray that God give us that. <laughs> let's, let's uh, you know, fight for that. Let's seek that. Focus on that in your marriage. To be partners, to be friends, and to have great sexual life. Because that's what God wants us to have. <clears throat> but... Sadly, they rebelled against God. They sinned. They fell. They weren't faithful. They didn't appreciate what they had. Which is terrible. They were deceived by Satan. And they were... Uh, they had to go out of the, of the garden. So we have here our second lesson. Adam and Eve out of the garden. And we find that in chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. This explains how, how it is that we, we, come, uh, we fall short in our quest for marital delight and intimacy. Because we, we, have, uh, we have enjoyed the, the delights of, of marriage. But after some time being married, we have experienced also the bitterness and the struggles and the disappointment of marriage which is really one of the most difficult things that we face in our lives, is disappointments in our marriage. We are happy when, we are, when, when our wife is happy, when she is not happy, hmm, very difficult, <laughs> very difficult, very difficult, painful. Everything, you know, everything, nothing works if she's not happy. 
So we, our fo the focus of our lives is to have a happy woman in, in our homes. <clears throat> and it's hard work, hard work. Please, ladies, understand your husbands. It's not easy for them. And please, husbands, make that the focus of your lives. Otherwise, we, nothing is going to work. And that was the case in Adam and Eve. It didn't work. It didn't work. It didn't last much. First, because Adam abdicated uh, his marital uh, calling as head of his wife. He didn't fulfill his responsibility as head of Eve. And then, because she didn't respect him properly, <clears throat> you know, chapter three, as I told you before, is a very sad chapter. Probably the, the, the most tragic chapter in the Bible is chapter three. Terrible. <clears throat> uh, in verse six, we read that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was delight, a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit. Can you, can you see what's going on here? What's going on here is that Eve, his, his mind had been changed. You know who changed her, her mind? Satan. Satan uh, gave, gave her uh, arguments, and she took Satan's argument, and her mind changed. God said, do not eat from this fruit, from this tree. tree. And now he's looking at the tree, and, 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 he's, and she's thinking, oh, this is good. This, this looks good, and I think it's good to eat. And it is uh, and it is desired to make me wise. God said, "This is death." And she said, and she was thinking, "No, this is good." And then it says that she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. And it is tragic to see that, to read that he was with her. And she didn't do anything. She didn't prevent this tragedy. He, he didn't prevent that. He didn't do anything. He was with her. On the contrary, he took from the fruit. And he knew because God himself had, had you know, had, I mean, he had said that it was, was death. So he abdicated. His responsibility, <clears throat> his calling. Read with me chapter, uh, verse 9, verse 9, chapter 3. It says, But the Lord God called um, the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of, the, of um, which I commanded you not to eat? 
And the the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. See what Adam is doing here? He's he's, um, justifying himself. He tells God, you gave me this woman. I'm not responsible. You gave me this woman. This woman gave me, and you gave me this woman. (laughs) So he's, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy like sometimes we are crazy. We don't take responsibility for what, what we are called to do in our marriages. It is very sad when, when, a, when, a, when a husband begins to speak evil of, of his wife. And he goes with his friends or with his pastor or with whoever. And he says, oh, my wife, oh, that's, that's, that's a woman. It's, you know, it's you. You knew her. Oh, you, would, you would understand. It's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. So that's what Adam did. Adam did. <clears throat> and, and, and in verse 17, God sp- speaks to Adam and says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife. See how God is, is, is you know, portraying this? God says to Adam, you submitted to your wife. She gave you. And you complied. So, at the end of the day, brothers, we are responsible. Even if our wives are in fault, we are responsible because we are heads. That's what the New Testament says, right? Uh-huh. So that was one of the reasons of their, their misery. And then, uh, this couple who was called to be friends and companions became adversaries. They became adversaries. When God, asks, uh, when God asks in verse 11, chapter 3, who told you that you were naked? The man said, the woman that you gave to be with me, she gave me. The woman. The woman. I don't want that woman. I regret to be married with that woman. I don't want to be friends with that woman. I cannot stand that woman. <laughs> Maybe there is someone here who cannot stand his wife. Is there someone here going through something like that? Brother, there is time for for you to reflect and to change your ways. Otherwise, it's going to be terrible. And the devil is, you know, the devil is, is uh, this behind everything. And uh, the truth is that living with a woman is not easy, but Living with a man, for a woman living with a man, is not easy to, because, you know, it's two sinners uh, sleeping in the same bed, living under the same roof. It's your sin plus her sin. Two sinners together, sinning together. And this is, and, 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 and unless we really understand what our calling and the resources that we had in God, we have in God, we can, we can be 
uh, we meant we may end up being adversaries, being enemies, sleeping with your enemy, the same bed. Ooh, that's not good. Not good at all. Very difficult. And that was the case with Adam and Eve. In, in verse 16, chapter 3, God said this to the woman, I surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. And then it says, listen to this, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be for your husband. What's the meaning of that? Your desire shall be for your husband. It means that she was going to desire Adam? No. It means that she, you know, the meaning in short here is that she was going to desire to rule of the of the man of the over man to you know to control him to manipulate him but god says but he shall rule over you Ooh, this is difficult <laughs> you can imagine a woman trying to manipulate the man and then the man rebelling against that manipulation and then will against will. You know? <clears throat> realities of marriage. These are realities of marriage. And all of us have experienced in some degree this kind of uh, struggles. Because we are humans, because we are descendant of Adam and Eve. Because we are living out of the garden. We are not in the garden. We are living in a fallen world. We are sinners, just like Adam and Eve. <coughs> so struggling in marriage is not something that should scare you, not something that should, you should, uh, uh, that should uh, uh, bring you to the point of you know, despair. Struggling marriage is part of life. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, another thing happened. Their sexual life, sexual life. Their sexual life was tainted, was ruined. You remember them walking naked without shame, enjoying their sexual life, enjoying, enjoying each other, their bodies, their sexual life, having control, but at the same time, delighting in sexual life. Because that's the picture that chapter two gives us. But then in chapter three, what happens? What happens? It says that the eyes of both were opened. Opened to what? Because that's what, what chapter 3, verse 7 says. Then the eyes of both were opened. Opened to what? Opened to, to see God more clearly? Open to see holiness, to see the glory of God? No. Open to see what sh they shouldn't be seeing. Open, open to see themselves out of fellowship with God. The verse, verse 7 says, and they, um, and they knew that they were naked. And they uh, 
how these fig leaves together and made themselves lame loin cloths. They were ashamed. They, they didn't have freedom anymore to enjoy sex, to enjoy their nakedness, to be open. They hid themselves from God and from each other. It has to do with their sexual, sexual life. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I was afraid, afraid, ashamed. Mm. Have you ever felt like that in your marriage? How many nights have we gone to bed ashamed, afraid of God, of our wife? For whatever reason, which is usually sinful. And it is sad that bed in the night with two lovers who rather are adversaries at that time. Sometimes they, sometimes they feel like they hate each other. They hate to be in that bed with that woman. That's, that's what's, got, what's going on with Adam and Eve. But brothers and sisters, God is good. God is merciful. God is a God of hope. God is a God of grace, of restoration. And, and, and listen to this. Chapter 3, as I told you, is, is the most tragic, probably the most tragic chapter in the whole Bible. Because it, it tells us when all, the, all our evils and our suffering began. But in the middle of chapter 3, we have verse 15. Verse 15. Brings la light, hope, power, grace in the midst of misery. What, what, what can we read in verse 15? Well, let's read verse 15. Chapter 3, verse 15. 15. It's God here speaking. He's talking to the, to the serpent. And what God, has, what God says to the serpent, listen, I will put enmity between, between you and the woman. You know what? That the serpent wanted to be friends with the woman. Probably the serpent said, oh, she's going to be my friend forever. And God comes and puts in the middle. And he says, no, no, no. I'm going to put enmity. She's not going to be your friend, okay? You deceived her. You have brought misery to her life and to Adam, to both of them. You have brought misery, but she's not going to be your friend. I'm going to put enmity. Here we have God declaring war, war against misery, war against sin. And God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. She's not going to be your friend. I'm going to gain back her to me. And I put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, 
This battle is going to be the battle for the ages. I'm going to be fighting to redeem. And you know what? It doesn't matter what's going on in your marriage right now. Probably you are in a very big problem, some of you. But God is speaking this morning. He says that he is going to fight for you, for your marriage, for us, by his grace. Because this is grace. This is grace. This is mercy. So God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between you, your offspring and her offspring. This is, this is the story of the Bible. This verse is, is the story of the Bible. The story of redemption. I think that it was Augustine who says that the Bible, the whole Bible, is a commentary on, on Genesis 3.15. <laughs> Genesis 3.15 is, is a seed, you know, that brings out all the rest of the scripture. All the, the stories that you read in the Bible come from here. And then in God says, he shall bruise your head, the offspring of the woman, which we know is Jesus Christ. You know, the story is long, and the offspring manifested in several ways, but at the end of the story is Jesus Christ. He shall bruise your head. Remember that God is speaking to the serpent. He's announcing, he's predicting that the, the serpent is going to lose this battle. And God says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And this, happened in the, this is what happened in the cross <coughs> where Jesus was dead. He died for our sins. He died because of our misery. He dies. He died because we are unable to find delight and intimacy with God for ourselves. We are unable by ourselves to, to find delight and intimacy in our marriages. It's only He who can help us. This was the only hope for Adam and Eve at this point in their, in their mis, miserable life, miserable life. They were, it was tragedy, it was terrible, very sad, you know, failure. In the extreme, but God speaking, God is speaking. And he gives promises of restoration. God commits himself to a covenant of grace here. Because this is a covenant. We learn later on in the scriptures that this is a covenant. And he commits himself to fight. He declares war against misery. Against the miseries of sin. And he promises to fight this war through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. His seed, the offspring. Paul says that, you know, in the book of Galatians and Romans. He explains, we have now, we have the blessing of having all the scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament to understand this. But in regard to our marriages, this means that there is hope for your marriage. There is hope of restoration. If someone here, someone here is, hasn't repented of his sins and hasn't 
believed in Jesus Christ hasn't come to him for mercy, for forgiveness. This is the time for you to do it. For you to have eternal life. To receive forgiveness for your sins. For restoration of your fellowship with God. And also for restoration of your marriage. Otherwise, the sin also brings you know, misery, misery and failure. The wages of sin are death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. You no, know? and God also restore, restores marriages and lives. He can take you out of your, of your addictions. Whatever it is, pornography, alcohol, drugs, violence, violence, whatever it is, can restore your life and bring intimacy again with him, with creation, with your wife, and delight, and delight to live life again. He said, I have come to give life, life. And you know, God, here in chapter 315 of Genesis, he guarantees the victory of his seed. He guarantees that he's gonna fight, that he's gonna win. He did that, sending his son, Jesus Christ, as a man, just like you and me, to live a life of obedience, an innocent life, a life that no man has been able to live, only him. A perfect man living a perfect life for us who are imperfect, who are sinners, he died on the cross. He was innocent. He didn't have to die, but he went to the cross for us. So that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to give us eternal life. And to restore our marriages. So what we have here in this last scene is Adam and Eve in their way back to the Garden of Eden. It's a long, long way. It's, it's full of, of a lot of difficulties. But if God is with us, he's going to bring us back to the garden. To the garden of eternal life. To, to the garden of grace. To the garden of a, a restored marriage. We want that. We want to ask God to give us that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the garden. Thank you for teaching us in chapter two of Genesis that you have a plan of delight and intimacy for us with you, with your creation and with our wives. And thank you because when we fail, when we are disappointed, when the struggles come, when sin and destru destructive addictions come to our lives. You are, you are a God, God of mercy. You are merciful. You are full of grace and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Help us, please, to understand and to live this kind of life in the name of Jesus. 
Amen.